I'm Hussein Sabour, born 1936, from an upper middle class family in Egypt. My father was an engineer. I had only one elder brother who passed away a few years ago. He was professor of medicine in one of the Cairo universities. Uh, when we were young, our mother taught us that we should be perfect in everything. Perfection was the model which we have to learn in all our life. We have to be clean, we have to be polite, we have to go to the school and be the first of our class without punishment. But this is the habit that we, we should do it. If we don't do it, we are neglected. So from my very young age, I learned that perfection is something normal, we have to do it. I was always the best student in my class. We never thought when we, I was young how rich we are. We were not rich at all, but I never thought about it because I used to dress and go to the school and uh, come back. During the year, the uh, year in school, we had no entertainment. We used to go to the school, come back to the house, learn and sleep. But in the summer, it is the contrary. We go to Alexandria, we have fun, four months of summer. So my life was eight months of severe hard work and four months of complete entertainment. I went to, to engineering because my elder brother went to medicine and he was the first of his class and I was the first of my class. I did not want any competition between us. He was the best and I was also not bad. Uh, during my preliminary year in engineering, I got ill all the year. I attended three days in university, then I got ill to April. So this was the first year I failed in my life. Between being the first in class every year and sudden failure was a shock to me. But I can say today it was an interesting teaching element to me. I understood that, that failure is not the end of the world. After this complete failure in the first year in university, I succeeded in the second half. But to me, it was the first time not to be the first, but to succeed in four s subjects. After that, I lost being the first. I completed the university as a medium or upper medium student. I was always succeeding by good, not very good or excellent. I lost the interest of being the first. I started to play more and to, to entertain myself during the year, not only in summer. And I say today, it is a good experience, the failure and knowing that it is not the end of the world. For the past three decades, Hussein Sabour has emerged as one of the most prominent names in the field of construction and real estate development in the Middle East and North Africa. My father passed away and died during my days in the university. And when I succeeded and became an engineer, I was the first in my family who did not want to work for the government. My family is government employees. My father was an engineer, my uncles are government people, my grandfather was a judge. All my family are working for the government. For some reason, I don't know why, I said, I don't want to work for the government. And I joined two friends in my residential area. I lived in Heliopolis at that time. 
and we formed an office. I do not know what does this mean, to go to, to our office, to try to get business. How can we get business in the Egyptian environment? How can we work? I don't know. But we, the three of us, were very much interested to be alone, not depending on something. I was the youngest of the three. After six months, the first job came to our office. So we stayed six months spending what we can for the rent and for the coffee boy. We had only renting an office and the coffee boy. After six months, it was the first job to come to me. And we were very happy. I still remember the name of the employer, Mr. Wilson Amin. He came to us to build a graveyard to his father, a Christian who was going to die within days. And he came to us, I don't know why, and told us, I need a graveyard to be built in three, four days. My father is going to die and we don't have it. So this was my first job, and I'm proud that the first job to me is building, or the three of us worked in building a graveyard for this Mr. Wilson Amin. After that, we grew gradually. My two partners, immigrated. The first of them went to the States because he was offered a scholarship in 1958. My second partner went to Canada in 1962. He was from a rich Christian family and his family in 1961 Nasser nationalized and got all the businesses to be public owned. So he said, my partner told me, why should we grow? Should we grow and work hard so that Nasser takes everything one day? I prefer to leave everything today. I am young and go and work outside. So in 1962, I was the only owner of this small office. Uh, I forgot to tell you that 1961, I married. I married Nagwa, whom I met in the university. When I was in the last year, she went to the first year. And at that time in engineering, there were only six girls in the university. So she was one of six girls. Everybody is looking at them. At any rate, I married her in 1961. I had no income except what I can get from my office. And uh, I can tell you, we suffered sometimes. But I am proud that she was the best helper and support to me. 1961, as I said, I married. 1962, I was alone in the office. 1961, 62, 63, 64, Egypt government made laws to interfere between the landlord of a house and the rent. So it reduced the rent several times it came 1964 to the last law that the owner of the house is not allowed to propose the rent. He builds the house and the government employees, they come and see the house and they say, you should rent it by 10 pounds or 12 pounds. So everybody left building houses, which was my business. So I found myself in, a, in an office, owning an office that has no work. But fortunately, I changed my business in, uh, instead of building houses to building industry. Because when Nasser nationalized the industry, he started to grow with it. He started to increase the industrial facilities. So I learned how to build a house. Then I learned how to build a factory. 1967, we had the crisis that we lost the war with Israel. The reaction in Egypt was that every resources should go to the army to build it again. We cannot live in that crisis all our life. We have to get Sinai back. This was a correct decision, but it affected my work. There was no money. People did not build houses. And the government stopped building factories. So what can I do? I had a small office at the time. Where we had about 10 employees. Most of them were engineers. 
and I was responsible for their life. They build their life on the salary they are getting from my office. So it was my responsibility towards my family first and towards my employees who believed in me and did not work for the government and worked for a small uh, company or a small office. I had to do something to make them continue living, to make them believe that they did not make wrong to leave the government and work for me. I had to go outside Egypt to find business. The chance, not by study or not by anything, the chance made me go to Libya, not to Saudi Arabia and not to the Gulf and not to Sudan. So I went to Libya to start trying to find business, to send it to my office in Cairo so that the engineers I have can work and we can earn our living. Therefore, I went to Libya to try to find business to my office in Cairo so that I can support my family and the 10 Egyptians working in my office. And the story how I went to Libya is very uncommon. I had a friend who has also friends from Libya, from the business community, and he told me that one of his good friends in Libya is very rich and wants to build a palace for himself. So he asked in Libya about the famous engineer, Egyptian engineer, so that he can ask him to design the palace. And they give him a name, and he got from this engineer the drawings and went to an Italian contractor to build it, the palace in Libya. So the Italian contractor told him, this is rubbish. I will not leave Italy to go to Libya to build this rubbish. So my friend told me, look how the Egyptians destroy the prestige of their country by doing something like that. I told him I want to see the drawings. I saw the drawings. They were not good at all. And I had no work in my office at that time. So I told my friend, tell your Libyan friend that one Egyptian in Libya deceived him and got money, did not do good work. Another Egyptian who is myself, for no money, I will repair the problem correct the problem and give him all the drawings of his palace or villa, grant I will not take anything. Which I did because I had no work in my office at all and my engineers were paid, so I did not lose anything by doing that. After that, when the Libyan rich man came in Egypt and saw my drawings, he found the difference. Although he's not an engineer, but he noticed the difference. So. This was the beginning how we started in Libya and we became partners with this famous engineer, famous businessman. Through him, in February 1968, I started my first visit to Libya and I started knowing his friends who were the prime minister at that time, the Bakush, who were the minister of interior, who were the head of the army and all other people to whom I gave my services and started to, to design for them what they wanted in Libya. This was how I started strong in Libya. I get from them the job, I send it to Cairo, they do the design and we go to Libya to, on the site, implement those drawings. Till 1969, the 1st of September, Gaddafi made his revolution and my friend, my partner disappeared was not in Libya, escaped. So I was the partner of the bad man. So I stayed in Libya one and a half years in very good life, and then I started to be in a very bad position. So I finished what I had in business, although I knew that I may not get any remuneration because all the people I'm contracted to are in the jail. But I said I have to do my work whether I get paid or not, I finished everything and left Libya and came to Cairo. Within one year, they started to ask about me 
Hussein is not in Libya. Where is he? He went back. And they found that I went back after I finished everything, after I did not get my remuneration, after I have a villa rented and I left it rented, after I left my car there, after I left my furniture there. So everything to them was strange that I did not escape because I'm a bad man. So they started to contact me again. Why don't you come back? So I told him I have my reasons. In order to come back, I don't want to be a partner to another Libyan who may be a good man today and a bad man after a few years. I want to work as a branch of my Cairo office. And they accepted that. So 1971, I returned back to Libya and started my office as a branch of Hassan Sabur office of Cairo. Still, it's operating till today. My Libyan office was only to try to find business and send it to Cairo for my people to work. And during that period, I started to increase the engineers in my office in Cairo because we had much work coming from Libya. Till 1975 came, and suddenly I noticed that at my office in Cairo got two major jobs in Cairo, which was a, an astonishment to me. We had, in the last period, no work coming from Egypt. So when I get two sudden big works, that means something is changing. So my sense told me that my presence in Egypt is more important than my presence in Libya these days. So I, I told one of my assistants, you continue in Libya and try not to ask me to come and I will concentrate on Egypt. And it happened, 1975 was my beginning of my concentration on my office in Egypt. My office in jumped in number of people, in jobs too much. We made the, all the Sadat city, we made all the cities of October city, we made Semiramis Intercontinental Hotel, we made the largest military factory in Egypt, we participated in the wastewater business scheme for Cairo, the wastewater scheme for the three cities, Port Said, Smiley, and Suez. We made power stations. We made distribution lines. We worked 17 years on correcting the electricity in Cairo, Alexandria, and 11 other major cities. We had too much work in Egypt till my office people working in it arrived or came to more than 1,200 engineers. Two, our business is too big. So this is how I started, very small, and how I jumped very big, and what happened to me. I was, when I was young, a ping pong player. I was one of the Egypt team, was not the, the number one. But I left playing since I left the university. What happened after that, that in 19, about uh, 84, I found my previous friends coming to me and telling me that the game and the federation had collapsed and became very bad. And we are losing our position in the world, even in, in the Arab world, even in Africa. We were the best of the best in the Arab world and in Africa. Now we are not. And it needs a strong director or strong head of the federation to correct the environment. I accepted that and I was elected 1984 as the chairman of the Egyptian Ping Pong Federation. I took two rounds, that means eight years, and I'm happy to say that in the end of the eight years, we made very aggressive uh, jump in Africa and in the Arab world and in our position worldwide. Just after that, the shooting club also knew what I did in the ping pong, 
Federation, and they asked me to come and do something here because my son was a player of judo in the shooting club, and he and his friends, at that time, my, my younger son was in university. He and his friends at that time thought that they are not having good support from the club. And my son told me, you are always talking about how to be honest, how to be correct, how to do something. We want you to do something to us, the junior federation, the junior people who want to live a better life. So I came to the shooting club, and thanks God, by the help of the young people, my son and his friends, I was elected in 1992, and I'm still the chairman of the shooting club. And this is my last round. I am 20 years is enough and more than enough. I think I did good work. I cannot talk about it. But something else happened. That about 1992-93, in this period of time, the uh, Egyptian engineering syndicate or federation came to me and told me they are the major shareholders in the Mohandas Bank and the bank is losing money in the last seven years and they want me to be the chairman of the bank. I told them I know nothing about banking. I'm an engineer. They said yes, but the previous chairman of the bank were three ex-ministers, engineering ministers. We are fed up of ministers. We want a successful businessman to lead the bank. I accepted that. I took the decision, the tough decision, and I stayed in the bank five years. I'm happy, very much happy of the results I made. When I took the bank as a chairman, the capital of the bank was 20 million pounds. I left it after five years. The capital is almost 200 million. The bank was losing seven years before I came to the bank. The last year I was the chairman of the bank, the bank made profit 134 million pounds. Uh, the people, the, the, the people, the employees of the bank were suffering because they had very little salary. And I told them I cannot increase the salary of a losing bank, but let us agree for something, work hard, help me that the bank would change to successful bank and making profits, and we will make a bonus system according to the success that happens. And I'm very happy that within a few years, not more than one or two years, the people of the bank, the normal people of the bank, every three months were getting five months, extra five months bonus. This is the normal. Some of them were getting higher than that and some were getting lower than that because it was measured by the success of their branches. On the other hand, I told them, as long as we are giving so much money for you when you succeed, do not excuse me if you do something wrong intentionally to ruin the bank, then I do the contrary completely. They told you, what is the contrary? I told them, I take you to, to the jail. And I'm not sorry to say that two of the employees of the bank went to jail. On the other hand, the 98% of the bank employees were very happy by the success of their bank and by the profit the bank was doing. He has accomplished numerous mega projects that are considered landmarks in construction and real estate development. Libya was a very important stop in Hussein Sabour's career.
At that time, after I started in Egypt, and I said we, we made huge projects in real estate and in tourism and engineering, I started to say, why don't we expand our engineering business outside Egypt? I found that Egypt at that time was getting loans and grants from many countries in the world, from France, from America, from the UK, from Germany, but each loan or grant have some restrictions that if America is, is helping Egypt to do a power station, the engineer of the power station should be American, the contractor should be American, the building material should be American, etc., etc. If France is giving money to Egypt to build a hospital, like Ain Shams University Hospital or Asr Aini Hospital, the engineer should be French, the contractor should be French, all the material should be French. I said, why don't we do it? We are not rich as Egypt, but the Arab world and the Islamic world is rich, is giving loans, is giving grants to Africa. I started to talk about it, nobody heard me. I was talking nonsense for people who don't want to hear. I said the, the best thing to do it is to talk as a group. So I helped and assisted in making Federation of Engineering of Islamic Countries. Now we can talk as a Federation of Islam. And we formed it in Turkey. And I was elected as the vice chairman in the first six years. And we, as the consultants of the Islamic countries, talked to the Islamic Bank in Jeddah, talked to all the Arab and Islamic funds, helping and supporting poor nations, do as the others are doing. And we changed the laws, and now they are not as strict and stiff as the Europeans and the Americans, but they now are putting in the shortlist that is invited to do the work as engineers or as contractors, some of our federation of Islamic countries, that means we are invited to do the work and we are having better chances to do this business. What does this mean? It added to all of us, including my company, work all over Africa, actually work in Europe, because some European countries are l ready and are correct to get Islamic loans. And we worked in Europe and we made some small dams in Europe funded by the Islamic Bank. We could not do it at all without changing the laws by the Federation of Islamic consultants that was done and in Turkey. Sabur was the vice chairman of the Federation of Consultants from Islamic countries and was the vice chairman of the African Business Roundtable as well. On the other hand, as we succeeded in Turkey, I said, why don't we do it in Africa? So again, I went to the World Bank and to the African Development Bank, which was in Abidjan, uh, Ivory Coast. And there, I started to throw my ideas again, and they were accepted easily. And we made Federation of Consultants from African countries, which is giving more chances to African consultants to get work in Africa if the work is financed or funded by the African Development Bank. Through this, we got, my company did work in Mauritania. We did the marina in Mauritania. We work in so many African countries. We could not do that work without changing the laws by imitating what the rich countries are doing. What does this mean? It means from my point of view, that we have to learn what are the successful people doing and do it again. We are not less than them. We are not that more, they are not more intelligent than us. They are not more active than us. They are not hard workers than us. So we have to know what is good 
and we do it for ourselves. After the war of 73, when Egypt gained the strength again, gained the power again, gained the dignity again, Sadat started to give more space in the economy to the private sector. At Nasser time, as we all know, everything was nationalized. When Sadat started to give that space and that open door for the private sector, the figures at that time, 1975 and 76, was 70% of the economy was in the hands of the government and 30% of the economy were in the hands of the private sector. The private sector felt that they are not well treated, well, not received. Every thief should be a private contractor. Every bad uh, man who loves ladies should be a private sector banker, for instance. So we, the private sector, said we cannot live like that. We have to do our business to, to correct the vision. So we formed, not I myself, but the generation which were elder than me at that time formed the uh, society to make Egyptian Businessmen Association. It is run by people who work in private sector, who are very good reputation, who are not young and were working years and years successfully in the private sector. After a few years, I became a member, and then I became a board member, and I'm very proud to be the chairman of this federation in the last years till today. This federation, is done for many reasons. The first reason is all business sectors like industry, tourism, agriculture, investment, etc. We have our problems. So this uh, association will work in committees, committee for tourism, committee for industry, committee for etc. to look at the problems in our country to look not only to shout that we have problems, no, but to try to find solutions of the problems, to try to get acquaintance with the ministries running their sectors, try to talk with the people in the ministry from the top to the bottom, giving them their problems, giving them the solutions, try to work together, not as enemies, but as friends, as having the same target, to improve the environment. Now, as I said, the private sector increased from 30% of the economy till over 70% today, and we are very happy that we reached this from 75 till two years, 1975 till today. We are well treated when the Prime Minister and the Ministry believes in us and we have very good relationship. We are not well treated when the Prime Minister does not believe in that and wants to control the, th the matter alone. I'll give you an example. Few, not few, long years ago, we started to make contacts with the Labour Federation. We told him, we are the owners of business, you are the workers. We are on the two sides of the table. Let's agree together that Egypt is our country. We want the prosperity to Egypt. Let's agree on things. And what we don't agree, leave it today. And we started working in silence, two years, in all the problems of Egypt. Starting from education, from everything you think about. And we agreed on most of the problems of Egypt, how to solve it. And we were very happy to sign an agreement between the Workers' Federation in Egypt and the Egyptian Businessmen Association. And we were very happy to go to the Prime Minister at that time and tell him, Mr. Prime Minister, here are the solutions of the problems of Egypt. Please read them. And the, all the people of Egypt agreed about them, either the owners of businesses or the workers in businesses. 
we thought that we did something marvelous. But unfortunately, he put the document in his drawer and did not open the drawer again. He said, you neglected asking the government to sit with you. You and the labor are not Egypt. We are Egypt. You neglected to ask us. Sabour, who has a long journey with business, is now the chairman of the Egyptian Businessmen Association and was the chairman of Egypt US Business Council. One of our targets in the few years I'm the chairman of the Egyptian Businessmen Association is to try to talk quietly, not in loud voices, to have meetings with the Federation of Industry, the Chamber of Commerce, the exporters, the uh, committee of the new towns. I believe that the Egyptian Business Association, since it started in the 70s, made marvelous work for the Egyptian economy. I like to see something which I always say I'm proud of. We had no one of our members since we, it was formed, till today, accused in a case in court. We have no one of our members since we started in the 70s, till today, in jail, or went to jail. Because to accept a new member, it is very difficult in our association. We have to look at his background. We have to look at his company. We have to be sure that he is a very honest business, Egyptian businessman. Egypt has a great history in architecture, but nowadays the image is not clear. How does engineer Hussein Sabour see it? Something people talk about is the bad architecture in Cairo, the bad architecture in Egypt. There's always a proverb that says, Architecture is an example of the real culture of the country. When the architecture of Egypt was perfect, you found music is perfect, theater is perfect, uh, writers who write novels are perfect. This is true. But when Egypt started to come down, in culture, we came down in the cinema, we came down in the theater, we came down in architecture. Now, after the revolution that happened last year, I hope, I'm not sure what I say, but I hope this is a push for everything to jump in the right track again. We can return back to be the best country in our region in culture, the best country in industry, the best country in economy, without having oil underground, without having gas underground. But Japan has no oil, has no gas, but has the people of Japan working and working hard and believe in their country. Sabour is married to Negwal Kusi and has two sons and eight grandsons. Here I have to say something. During my first Arrival to Libya, I had no salary. I was partner, so I could not 
get any remuneration, any money before we make profit. So I did not send any money to my family, to my wife. I had at that time one child. What happened? She did not ask anything. She left me in my troubles and she had to sell all the jewelry she had, although they were not too much. And she never said this story, but I say it, and I say that without the support of that faithful wife, I, I could not reach what I reach today. Now I have two sons, both are engineers. The elder one is working in real estate business, and the younger one is working in tourism business. I am supporting them, giving them my experience, giving them my knowledge, my knowledge in life, my knowledge in management, but they are the active directors of the, those companies. Mm -hmm.